Hello everyone! I present to you today an entirely fictional scenario. Imagine a car company that is famous for selling cars to street racing enthusiasts. Powerful engine, stick shift, sleek design. Now, this company, after taking some time off uh, of producing new models for this particular car, has suddenly announced the next generation of cars in this well-known line. It's going to have a V4 engine, automatic gear shift, and it's going to be tiny, just small enough to fit maybe one and a half people. You know, you go out, you get your groceries in it, and that just about fits. It'd be the definition of a compact car. The logo of the car is going to be exactly the same as the series that was famous for street racing. And if you breadline the engine, maybe it'll go kind of fast. The company tells you how great it is, that it's as a compact car, it's going to fit in those tight parking spaces, it's going to have great gas mileage, and it'll drive in traffic just like the previous car did. So I guess by the definitions of a car, it is a pretty good car. But to the enthusiasts, the people who knew and loved this brand of car, it in no way resembles the street racers that came before it. You find out a lot of its development was outsourced to a Chinese company that designs these ergonomical little cars, and all of its cars are pretty much the same. So at its core, it in no way appeals to the street racers who spent years loving this brand. The core demographic speaks out on social media, downvotes the trailers for the car, and pretty much voices their outrage at a car company that is now completely out of touch, taking the beloved brand name and turning into something the core buyer group can no longer relate to at all. Automotive magazines start berating these would-be consumers in their anger. The automotive magazines call them entitled, According to the automotive magazines, these consumers don't get a say in what kind of car the car company makes. It's going to be a great car, so they should sit down, shut up, and buy the car when it comes out. Many individuals also go to social media, broad painting these cars enthusiasts as spoiled children. But when you actually look at the individuals who are posting on social media, you know, broad painting people, you look at their profiles, and their profiles tend to not just be fans, but they actually work for automotive magazines or they're social media consultants for small car companies, or they're part of agencies whose entire purpose is to expand the small car market. In short, the calm collected media and the individuals who have taken to their websites and social media denouncing the angry enthusiasts are actually heavily biased in favor of the car manufacturers. The automotive magazines have been given early access to these cars so that they can review them. And it turns out that these automotive magazines, their businesses hinge on them reviewing these cars early. If they don't get the early looks, then people will buy magazines that do get the early looks. So they're afraid of angering these car companies and losing that early access. So online media, fearing loss, and paid social media shills just doing their job protecting the product, they start on a campaign to discredit the very legitimately angry enthusiasts who are just looking to have the next generation of their favorite street racing car. And the compact automatic V4 is what they were offered. And the car company said that they are aiming this directly at those, those previous fans, that those, those previous fans of their cars are gonna love this new car, even though it's nothing like it. The car company, and by extension, the various social media presences and websites and things have all pretty much decided that this company is entitled to your money. And if you are angry, that the company's not catering to you, you're just an entitled, spoiled brat. They don't really seem to understand the concept of supply and demand and how in the information age where instead of complaining to your best friend, you can complain to thousands of people at once, how that can create a voice of the people where the people can make their wishes known to companies before those companies even put a product out. In short, we've tipped the vessel 
that used to just be company offers service, we pay for service if we want. Now, our opinions are out there with just as much volume as these so-called magazines or websites. And the result is that these websites and the people that comprise them have to talk down to the masses to berate them because they're a threat. The collective consciousness has now started to outweigh the publications that used to shape the public consciousness. They are now operating on the same level, and that is why the magazines are trying to beat down the public consciousness when it doesn't conform to what is convenient for the publications. It won't work, of course. But this is the kind of behavior that we're looking at. So when you see these publications judging people, labeling people, broad painting gamers as this or that, they are not worth engaging with. Don't go to their websites. Don't give them traffic because that's what they want ultimately. It doesn't matter if you're going to their website to post an angry comment or you're going to their website to legitimately read it as a fan. You are providing them with the same amount of eyes on it. Viewership. You're giving them power through this. Obviously, you guys have figured out that I'm not talking about cars at all. Welcome to Diablo Immortal, a Diablo game nobody asked for, being published by Blizzard, apparently being developed by NetEase, a mobile developer who have themselves already made Diablo clones. Now, I'm actually of two minds on this topic because... I think that outsourcing to another company is not a negative unto itself. I've said this every time Nintendo takes down a fan project, which is superior to the original product. If you have any pride as a developer, you would seek to rise to the occasion and build a product that is even better than that fan work. Or if you're really smart, in addition to having pride in your work, you would hire the fan developer in order to create an official adaptation of that fan work, something that no longer competes with Nintendo, but is actually part of the Nintendo family. When you have a company making a ripoff of your game, and it's actually better than your game in many respects, it's really good to hire or at least contract that person to make that for you. NetEase is famous for their Diablo clone, uh, Endless of God, Endless Gods, depending on how you translate it. Diablo fans were looking for an improvement on the old game, not a spin-off, not a, a low quality, what looks to be a cash grab. So since I mentioned Diablo fans, let's, let's go ahead and define them. We have classic fans of Diablo 1, the hardcore dungeon crawling experience, with a dark, gothic atmosphere and foreboding enemies. Difficult gameplay in the beginning. It was slow, methodical, and a mistake early on could easily kill you. Only later, when you gained spellbooks and powers, would you actually be able to stand a chance in the more difficult sections. Picking your character's stats were extremely important, as there was no respec option or refunds for your stat points. Developing your character just right was a task that if you screwed up and you were a perfectionist, you're starting the game over. From there, we have classic fans of Diablo 2 Lord of Destruction, a less hardcore but certainly faster paced game. It maintained that dark gothic atmosphere. And although the enemy designs were just as foreboding this time around, you got an arsenal of powers to deal with them, provided you took your time, you didn't get overwhelmed by hordes of enemies, and you weren't unlucky with certain apexes of uh, enemies. That is, you know, champions that rolled specific stats. There can be just nearly unstoppable ones, depending on your difficulty level you're on and um, how well you built your character. So while the game was far more story-centric than the original, building your character was still a daunting task. And while later patches let you earn respects, 
screwing up your respecs meant you'd have to go off to farm the four primary bosses to gather their essences to craft a respec item. It, it wasn't easy. And depending on the level you screwed it up, you might be creating a new character. The final patches of the game introduced synergy skills, which gave certain skills bonuses to other skills, creating extremely great combinations, and making it so that building a character, when combined with specialized unique items, your choices were nearly infinite. For fans of the previous two games, we have the free-to-play game Path of Exile and the purchasable Titan's Quest, as well as a few other games that have picked up the mantle of Diablos 1 and 2. Sadly, the developers of Diablo 2, the people who did the expansion pack, who made Diablo 2 truly great, they would move on to another studio, Flagship, and that would utterly fail to produce the product people wanted out of a first-person Diablo. It was called Hellgate London, it was a rushed, broken product. I remember providing feedback on either the alpha or the beta saying that you really need to work on your level design because I have built better levels myself in the WorldCraft editor for Quake 1. There were a couple Blizzard employees who laughed when I told them I uh, sent that kind of feedback. There was kind of a rivalry going on between the Blizzard employees who stayed versus the ones who were building Hellgate London. But yeah, my, my feedback from the Alpha wasn't good, and as it went into the beta and the full release, I could tell this was not a game I wanted to play into the future. Now the term flagshipped is an industry term, where you take your studio, you spin it off, and it sinks. It's unfortunate, but that's just the way it went. From there, Quite a few of the people who worked on Hellgate London would spin off again into Runic Games and produce Torchlight, one of my favorite games of all time. Torchlight is a colorful, cartoony version of Diablo 1, and Torchlight 2 is that to Diablo 2, to the point where Torchlight 1 is just one gigantic dungeon. There's also a bonus dungeon, but one gigantic dungeon in the canon story. And then at the end of Torchlight 1, you defeat Ordrock the villain, a.k.a. Diablo. In Torchlight 2, it picks up where one of the people has taken up Ordrock's heart and has become the wanderer going through the lands, causing chaos in his wake. Torchlight 2 is literally the Diablo 2 to the Diablo 1, but it has embraced a cartoony, lighthearted style. Both games are quite moddable and have a wealth of modifications available to players. Torchlight 1 is a really fun single-player game. Torchlight 2 is a good multiplayer game. There are countless other games that have tried to pick up the Diablo mantle, but I think Path of Exile is the closest to nail both the gameplay and the atmosphere that Diablo had. There are certain mechanics in building your character that are completely wild in Path of Exile. For example, it uses like the Final Fantasy VII type materia system for skills, and it uses the Final Fantasy X type sphere grid for building passive skills and stats on your character. It is it is different to Diablo. It is not a clone of Diablo, despite playing very similar to Diablo. Still, Path of Exile has my high recommendation. Anyway, then we get to Diablo 3, and oh boy, this is a difficult one to talk about, because Diablo 3 feels like World of Warcraft developers made a Diablo-like game. It understands nothing about pacing, and you go from just being a dude or a chick looking for the fallen star and fighting some monsters to suddenly fighting demon gods and being declared the Nephilim within the first couple hours of the game. Diablo 3 is colorful, but not to the point of embracing Torchlight cartoony style. It straddles the line between Bright and Diablo, and in doing so, it fails to create an identity of its own that I would consider meaningful. It feels like, again, some World of Warcraft developers just tried to emulate what Diablo was, while failing to understand some basic things about Diablo, and what made Diablo great. So unlike the previous games I've listed, Diablo 3 is really scared of commitment. The other games, you pick your stats, you pick your skills, and you'd have to go and get some kind of refund or respec, which is difficult sometimes. 
uh, sometimes cost prohibitive in these other games. But in Diablo 3, other than picking your class, your skills are instantly refundable. Stats are a thing of the past. In short, it's been streamlined and simplified to the most extreme level where it's a pale shadow of what Diablo was. Now, most fans of Diablo 1 and 2 ended up going over to games like Path of Exile, and they felt alienated by Diablo 3. However, Diablo 3 generated its own fan base of loyal followers in addition to the people who stayed with Diablo 3. So, what we refer to as the Diablo fan base is actually this gigantic cluster of fans who, some like Diablo 3, love it, are excited for more like it. Others, like Diablo 1 and 2, and really hoping Blizzard is going to go back to its roots. So, with the, all this internal conflict within the Blizzard community, this brings us to the very unfortunate reality that is Diablo Immortal. I am constantly calling it Doom Immortal, or Diablo Eternal, because we've got Doom Eternal, and I don't know, it's just a sticking point in my head. Either way... We had this most unfortunate announcement, where the first major question was, is this going to be available on PC? Which is a legitimate question, considering all the previous Diablos have been on PC. Yes, there have been console ports, and those, the console port of Diablo 3 was not bad. It was a fundamentally different game, because it just showered you in loot all the time. Even more casual than normal Diablo 3, but it still provided a decent experience. There is a lot of elitism within gaming, and some of that elitism is based in fact. It is a fact that the PC can do more than consoles. And it's a fact that consoles can do more than mobile devices. You can enjoy playing on whatever base you want. That's not a problem. The issue is very rooted in appearance because people who tend to sit in front of their computer or in front of their Xbox or PlayStation, they are not mostly, mostly. There, there are exceptions always, but for the most part, they are not mobile gamers. Mobile games in the general gaming sphere have been tainted by things like Candy Crush, for example where you run up against a paywall and you have to pay to continue playing the game. The actual perception that has permeated is that Diablo Immortal is being made by Netties, a mobile game manufacturer, which means they won't take the tender loving care of Diablo. Whether this is true or not, it doesn't matter because remember, Blizzard's gonna be the publisher, not the developer in this relationship as we understand it. So as we understand the relationship, NetEase is going to be taking the helm on this. They're going to load it up with microtransactions because the game's gonna be free to play, and that is our fear anyway. Because we look at it, and when they say the mobile market is the biggest growing market ever, they usually mean in profit potential. As in these developers, typically build their games around monetization features. I mean, look at Shadow of War, for instance. Shadow of War is not a mobile game, but you would think it was based on how it came out with the in-game store where you had Mirian and uh, the, the real currency, and you used the real currency to buy packs of orcs and things like that. They ended up rebalancing the entire game when they remove those microtransactions as a way to dodge the impending legislation by various European countries against loot boxes. They originally lied and said that Shadow of War just gives you an extra opportunity to buy things, when in reality, we look at how they retuned the game after removing the microtransactions, and we know we know how much of it was tainted by microtransactions just looking at the patch notes. The fact is that Diablo Immortal is going to have to fund itself some way. And if it were just Blizzard on its own, I would trust them not to sell power. I would trust them not to gate content. 
I'd be looking at this mobile game and I'd be like, okay, so they're just going to add cosmetic microtransactions. It's going to be cool, right? I don't know if I trust NetEase to that level. In fact, I don't know if I trust Blizzard that much anymore either. And that's unfortunate because I like World of Warcraft, both the upcoming classic and the current version. I don't like MOBAs at all, but Heroes of the Storm is the MOBA I dislike the least because it's very objective-based, as in the game can be won entirely by the side objectives on various maps. Warcraft 3 and StarCraft are both packed full of custom maps, so it's like Bethesda all over again. You know, these custom maps have their own rules, and you end up with these amazing little arcade modes inside of Warcraft 3 and StarCraft. I've made my case for Diablo 2. It's an amazing dungeon crawler. And I think that, in general, Blizzard is still one of my favorite companies. Now, I don't think that any of our complaining is going to stop them from releasing it, of course. But they've tarnished their reputation pretty hard. And in saying... Do you guys not have phones? Yeah. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah. Do you guys not have phones? I mean, come on now. You can get a phone that can play games like Diablo Immortal for about 80 bucks if it's used. But if you're going to want to buy a brand new one, it's probably going to run you over 600 bucks. Sure, there's some exceptions out there. But do you really want a low-quality piece of crap as your cell phone? <laughs> no, no, you got to buy the big expensive one that can play Diablo Immortal. And I think that rather than asking the question, is this an out-of-season April Fool's joke, they should have asked about monetization. They should have asked about time gates and things like that. They should have asked about NetEase's development in this. The fact is that we're getting a lot of PR damage control, both by Blizzard itself and by various publications in quote-unquote games journalism. We're getting a lot of tweets and Facebook posts by people that have an extreme conflict of interest as they seem to be in the business of promoting mobile games. In short, I would keep an eye on Diablo Immortal very closely. Elder Scrolls Blades, another mobile game, this one by Bethesda, it looks to be something that I actually want to play. I don't know how it's monetized, and that bothers me. So I'm not telling you all, quickly pre-register for Elder Scrolls Blades and play it now. No, I'm saying keep an eye on this, because it might be great or it might be horrible, and I intend to talk about it either way. So thank you all for watching. I do love my Diablo-like games. I've been a fan of the franchise since the original Diablo, and Diablo 3 disappointed me greatly with its always online live service and real-life money auction house. They fixed it with the expansion, kind of like how Diablo 2 was fixed by Lord of Destruction expansion. The issue here is that it seems Blizzard does not take Diablo seriously. They want to use it like they used Warcraft in a, in a kind of spin-off like Hearthstone in order to make oodles and oodles of money. In other words, it's not games as an art form. It's games as a service. Games as a money-making platform. It might still be games as an art form, but that art form, I, I would say, is compromised. At least in comparison to how it used to be. In Diablo 2. Thank you all for watching. Click the links on the screen for more content. And we're getting pretty close to Fallout 76 time. I know a lot of people have been playing that beta, but I'm not breaking it early. I'm sitting back and watching. And every time someone complains and they go, Well, it's only in beta! I'll play the full release and we'll see how many of those it's still in beta are still around. <laughs> you all have a good one now.